Thank you. So uh, let me indeed first thank the organizing committee. Well, not so much maybe for inviting me. I mean, they had to and support. But, uh, <laughs> only for organizing this one wonderful meeting. At least it has been wonderful so far, uh, both from the content point of view and also from organizational point of view. So indeed, uh, once every few years I would give a talk or write a paper or both about Mondes modified inertia. But in, the, in, in this particular context, uh, this talk would emphasize more the need or the advisability to consider a wider range of uh, theories so on and using uh, modified inertia as, uh, as an example of a direction that differs from the one uh, taken by most uh, theories so far. So, yeah, let me start by my definition of MOND. I mean, we've heard several uh, today, but uh, here I put emphasis not so much on the relation between acce the MOND acceleration and the Newtonian acceleration, but rather on the uh, uh, scale invariance that is obeyed in the big MOND limit. I think it's important. So MOND is based on, uh, at least as far as I see it, is based on three basic tenets or, or axioms. One is, of course, the introduction of a new constant in the dimensions of acceleration. So you're supposed to write some theory that generalizes. Uh, I will stay within the non-relativistic regime in this talk. So you want to write a theory that uh, involves this new constant uh, that gives you uh, the ability to calculate systems and how they behave dynamically. So these constants will appear in different results of the theory, and you want that uh, if you formally take this constant to zero, which essentially means that all accelerations, all relevant accelerations in the system are much larger than they know, you want in this limit the theory of the result, the specific result, to go to the Newtonian result, so this is the correspondence principle, to retain all the successes of Newtonian dynamics. And in the opposite limit, you require that the system become scale invariant, namely that all the results of the histories of, of uh, it, 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 if you have a system that is well within the Dickmon limit, or acceleration much, much smaller than they know, you want the history of the system to be such, or the only solutions of the theory to be such that when you multiply all scales, all length scales, and all times by the same factor, you get another history. It is also a solution of the history, of the theory. So this is what is meant by symmetry uh, that the theory obeys. And uh, the important thing is to realize, partly lucky, partly maybe not so lucky, that there's also that there is a large number of uh, predictions that follow from only these very basic tenets. What well, is lucky in the sense that you you can indeed. Uh, make many predictions even before you have a theory. And uh, on the other hand, it uh, makes uh, things difficult to distinguish between theories, because all theories that, uh, that uh, embody the, the basic tenets of MOND will automatically give you all these predictions. So it will become somewhat uh, not so easy to distinguish between theories. At any rate, some examples of what I call, uh, uh, you could call them primary predictions or first tier prediction. So just from the, from the scaling variance, you can prove that the velocity, circular velocity, around any object, any isolated object, should become constant. So underlying the asymptotic flatness of rotation curve, the baryonic tally fisher relation is automatic from scaling variance and the centrality of A0. Uh, rotation curves are by and large the more or less determined by this, uh, up to some details. Uh, the, the fact that uh, there is the so-called sigma M sigma relation for systems in the deep mode regime, which says that sigma to the force over MGA0 has to be a constant, a universal, uh, not universal, but a constant of order unity. The exact value of it does depend on theory, and may even within some theories it is a, a, an universal constant, but 
in other theories it varies from system to system, but has to be around unity, enhanced stability of disks, centers, the so-called center surface density relation. Now, are all, they all follow uh, up to some details from just the general uh, the, the basic tenets. But there are the important predictions that are not. And so, for example, the exact shape of the predicted rotation curve, the dependence of this uh, M over sigma force on, on system parameters, the workings of the EFE, that's very important, can differ greatly from system to system exactly. I mean, that there should be an EFE in general just follows from the nonlinearity of MON, but the, uh, the exact uh, that implications of it can differ greatly. One of the things that we want to demonstrate today, uh, the effects, uh, mond effects in the solar system can vary uh, greatly from, from COE to COE, dynamical frictions and so on. So in the summary, at least to my mind, there isn't yet a fully satisfactory mond COE, and this is something we are working on, or some of us are working on. So the general layout for, for COEs is the following, or the general directions or avenues that have been taken. So of course there are relativistic COEs that uh, started with Tevez, about which we are from Bob, and ending up at the moment with Ice uh, from, from Scordis. In the, in the meantime, there were some other COEs, my own Bimon and so on, I don't go into this. Another avenue that has not yet merged with the, the, the first one is to look for uh, what, what I like to call microscopic approaches to try to get mond, eventually, hopefully, some fundamental mond COE based on such approaches, but so far it has only led to some very interesting, very intriguing ideas of how to get mond-like behavior, how to introduce maybe a, a knot from first principles and some examples are uh, the vacuum effect, which I proposed at the time, and topic gravity, about which we heard from Eric, for Linde, by bipolar dark matter, about which we hear from, from Luke Blanchet, superfluid dark matter, and so on. So that's another thought that, unfortunately, I don't think that has yet led to a, um, the full-fledged theory that we can use to calculate arbitrary But When I say full-fledged theory, I mean something like Newtonian dynamics or dynamics or general relativity that in principle at least can be used to calculate any system that you that you want. And then there are non-relativistic effective COEs. So they, they simply, uh, or at least not as ambitious as, as to try to, to found the, themselves on some basic principles, but they're just, you write down a Lagrangian for a COE using uh, different degrees of freedom to either describe gravity or the, the particle degrees of freedom in the case of modified inertia. And you, 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 you write them in a way that will satisfy the, the, the basic tenets of mod, and so they will automatically give the main results. And then you can look and see what they tell you about other things, and not, not the, the first key results, but let's say the secondary, result, the secondary prediction compare this with experiment, maybe use experiments to call out some of the COEs and constrain COEs and give you some, some direction. Hopefully, these different approaches will merge at some point and to give some fundamental COE, uh, but this hasn't happened yet, as I'm saying. So, just, uh, so we do have some COEs in this vein. We have uh, Aqual, and uh, the, what the first one that uh, Beckenstein and I suggested in 84. Um, I should say that the, the way that this COEs were uh, sort of invented or was not uh, exactly systematic. So Aqual was proposed to actually have a Lagrangian non-relativistic theory that, uh, that uh, generalizes the Poisson equation and fit it into the Mond uh, framework. Uh, and it, you know, we were quite happy with it for many years. When I say we, the, the very few of us that were interested in MON, you know, those years, and worked on MON. So with Aqual, uh, some of us, like Jacob, Beckerstein, and Bo, were trying to generalize it uh, to relativity. Personally, I just worked on it to, to see
philosophy, what, what, uh, what prediction it can make, numerical calculation, and so on. So we were rather pleased with it for many years. We didn't try to invent new theories. And uh, uh, Qmon was a, really stumbled on. I, I just stumbled on it uh, by chance without trying to look for, for other theories. And that, that was 20 years after the advent of, uh, of, of Aqua. Why, why am I telling you all this? Because it uh, emphasizes the fact that there was no uh, conscientious attempt to look for other theories. So we were basically happy with what we had, and we worked with this. Many people wrote uh, numerical uh, codes to simulate, for example, Qmon, which turns out to be easier to, to work with, and so on. But at some point, and, and over the years, I've always been emphasizing, I think, uh, people who testified to this, that Qmon and Aqua cannot be the, the final answer. And they, they are simply something that we have and that we work with, but the, the, I could see that there are many predictions that they make that are not necessarily uh, universal to more. They're not gen necessarily generic. But it was just a statement. But in recent years, I've come to more appreciate the fact that examples are needed. So it's not enough to say that this theory produces uh, predictions that are not generic. You actually need to demonstrate it. So I, I uh, just sat down to try to think and invent other other theories. And, uh, so you could you could ask why why try to invent other theories? What's wrong with those? I mean, why, why aren't you happy with those? So I, I think most of us are familiar with the main reason. So, so one, one reason is that these theories involve so-called interpolating function, which interpolates, of course, between the Newtonian regime and the Digmon regime. But they are put in by hand. Not only they are put in by hand, they are put in by hand at, at the very basic level of the theory, the Lagrangian already. And what are they? They, they are just a, a single function of a single variable. And that is, first of all, it's indicative that the theory cannot be fundamental. This has not happened uh, in other instances of modifying, uh, let's say, from going from classical physics to general rel to, to relativity. Of course, there's no interpolating function that appears at the level of the Lagrangian. They appear later on as different results. Same is true in quantum mechanics. So, so clearly, it's something that is not fundamental. But even if you are willing to accept something that is just a working uh, hypothesis, then it's, it, it is very restrictive to just impose on the theory one function of one variable, and this function will then appear everywhere in the theory, will determine everything. So, for example, you, you could, in principle, determine this function in the case of Mon from the rotation gets off from the RAR, and then it is the same function that enters everywhere in the rotation, in the, 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 for example, in the solar system effects or in the, uh, in, in the external field effect, just everywhere. That is much too restrictive. And it's not what happens in, in other theories, because quantum mechanics and relativity do have interpolating functions, but these are specific to the phenomenon and they are certainly not introduced at the level of the action. So I, I would say that even if at this level of accepting the, the, because of our limitations, in, in, in default of a of more fundamental theory, we accept the fact that we want to introduce, that we introduce <coughs> interpolating functions, then at least let's try to find theories in which uh, this, this is all not so, so restricted. So my aim here is, twofold essentially. One is indeed to acquaint you <coughs> with uh, so-called modified inertia theory, in what ways they are different from modified gravity theory, in particular from Qmon and Aqua, which are the sort of present workhorses of the Formon. So this is one thing, but also to, to use it as an example and demonstrate that, that there could be other theories, even at the non-relativistic level even at the non, not, not so fundamental level, just as the effective theory, that could produce very different, uh, different results, different predictions. Now, it, I want to emphasize, because uh, in recent 
the months or even years, there was some apparent uh, impression that, that the dichotomy is between modified gravity and modified inertia. So if it's modified gravity, they, it's clear what, what they predict, and then if you want other prediction, you need to go to modified inertia. So that is not the case. Even within modified gravity, there can be a variety, and a disparity between different, different possible theories. So uh, just in recent months, I actually proposed two different classes of modified gravity mons, the one, one I will not mention, that was a few months ago, and one that I actually posted on the archive just a few days before the meeting. It, it is, uh, I, I don't mean to discuss it here, it's just an example. So it, it is a class of theories that uh, involves three, three potentials, so in, in Cumont, you know what we have two potentials that, that appear in the Lagrangian. One of them is forced by the equations of, of the field equation to be the Newtonian potential. And the, the other potential is the, the Mont potential. Um, you can also generalize these two potential theories, but in, in, in ways that are mathematically more complicated. So they're dif difficult to demonstrate things with. Uh, but this, this, this is uh, something that is quite easy in the sense that even though there are three potentials, the field equations are not truly coupled, so you don't have to solve, solve them simultaneously for the three potentials, uh, but in steps, uh, as, as is the case in Cumont. So one potential is, as in Cumont, identified by the field equations to be the Newtonian potential. You plug this in the second field equation that gives you the second potential, which you then plug in the third equation that gives you the more potential. But uh, it can lead now here, so the, the interpolating function here is a function of three variables. This is the thing that started me on this. I wanted to demonstrate that it's possible to write theories with a more complicated uh, interpolating scheme between the Newtonian and, and the, and the Mon regime. So, for example, if you go to the deep mon regime, in Cumont and in Aqua, where there's only one function, but scale invariance dictates that in the deep mon regime, everything is given. I mean, there's no free function anymore. So, for example, the, the mu function in, in Aqua has to go to x. Mu of x has to go to x. So, there's no free function yet to, to specify there, similarly in Cumont. But here, even if you go to the deep mon regime, scale invariance here cannot be expressed as simply saying that A is square root of A0 times, times, times A Newtonian. There is a more complicated dependence, and it's very interesting. Uh, maybe I should say much more about this. It's, it's on the archive already. Uh, but it, there is a great affinity to human and aqua in the sense that, for example, for spherical systems or one-dimensional systems in, in general, it is still the case that the moment of acceleration is a function of the Newtonian acceleration. So basically, they are, in this system, they are equivalent. They are all, all six zeros are, are equivalent if you choose the same interpolating function. But uh, in general, for non-symmetric non, non systems like galaxies, for z motions and so on, they, they make different predictions. Okay, so enough of modified gravity. Just again to emphasize variety and disparity in second, uh, secondary predictions can also occur with the modified gravity theory. So it's not only between modified gravity and modified inertia. So what is modified inertia? It's uh, not so easy to, to define it really. At, at some level, it's quite easy. So let, let's start with this easier level. So uh, Newtonian dynamics is uh, I, I use the, the mouse, but I, I cannot see the cursor. Okay, so, so this is the Lagrangian of uh, Newtonian dynamics. Okay, this is the, the gravitational potential. It, is cu it couples to density in this kinetic term of, the, of matter. If you vary over matter degrees of freedom, you get A equals minus grad phi, so it establishes the the Newtonian potential of the gravitational field, and varying over phi gives you the Poisson equation. So, aqua, cumont, or uh, modified gravity, this 
the high potential theory that I described before. They all modify gravity in the sense that they, they modify the Poisson part, leaving these two intact. So this equation is still correct, but this equation is modified. And that is a modified gravity. In, you could just say modified inertia, I will modify this part of the, the, the Lagrangian. So um, you, you can also think of this, of course, as one half of sigma of mi di squared for individual particles. This is written for continuous distribution. But anyway, so in modified inertia, you modify it. Uh, conceptually, okay, and, and, and then you can uh, uh, ask yourself, okay, but what happened in relativistic case? Uh, what could be the origin of modified inertia? Do I need to modify also the other fields? For example, the, let us say I want to, uh, the electromagnetic field, sure, I want to modify it because, you know, photons are particles, they should also get in inertia. And in general, you could say that, that inertia, in, in the general scheme of things, that inertia is, is encapsulated in the, in the so-called free actions of the degrees of freedom. But what, what is inertia? Inertia is basically the, the cost that you have to pay in, in energy, for example, if you want to change the, the, the let's say, the velocity of particles. So one, you know, half of this square is the kinetic energy, and it also encapsulates energy. So uh, again, without, uh, without entering in, into details, uh, modified inertia can result in, from, for example, from interaction of particles, I mean, no, um, there has always been uh, the, the, the big question since, since Newton's time, what is the origin of inertia? What does it mean? Why, why, why does it cost us something to, to, to change the velocity of the particles? And this goes back to, uh, for example, uh, to, to, to Bishop Berkeley anyway. You know, uh, Newton was attacked on the basis of this. And uh, since Newton, people have tried to understand inertia in more basic, more fundamental terms, not just take it as, as given, which we do until today, but actually try to derive it in some ways. And in, in fact, nature is full of, uh, physics is full of examples where you have effective inertia. Okay, so in, even, you know, the, the, the Higgs mechanism for endowing mass with particles is a mechanism. that the fermions or electrons and so on in, in the standard model do not have a mass term as such. They acquire the mass of the quark, acquire the mass by interaction with the, with the Higgs field. Basically, there is the Higgs field that is uh, ever present, omnipresent, and when, when particles, particles interact with it, and it costs energy to, give them, to, to, to change the velocity. So, so it's an acquired, acquired inertia. Of course, the normalization in, 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 in particle physics, the mass of normalization changes the mass of the particles, so it, it, it constitutes at least a modified inertia. Uh, electrons that move in solids, we know that sometimes behave like three particles, but with a different mass, not with their own mass. So the interaction with the medium causes uh, or puts a cost on trying to, to accelerate them. So when you, you're trying to accelerate the particles through the medium, it, it costs energy and this appears as inertia. So inertia is, is not, it's not uh, really unthinkable to, to take inertia not as a, some fundamental thing, but as, a, as an acquired thing. And if it is acquired, then it could be modified or under different circumstances. So I, I will not enter uh, this kind of, of very, uh, very interesting, Questions. Uh, but anyway, just to, to give you a gist of it, that at, at least uh, uh, this, taking this avenue of modified inertia opens a, a, a new uh, range of possibilities for, fundam for fundamental <laughs> Modified gravity, too, has, has its own choice of, of uh, ideas of fundamental theories like Fermi's uh, idea. So, so here, as, as, as the last sentence says, I will just 
bypass all these very deep and interesting questions and just jump to uh, this idea of, of effective, effective uh, CO, effective CO, which not ask where inertia comes from, but just dictate some modified inertia through the action. So I have this slide about who is afraid of modified inertia because I sense that there is uh, quite a bit of resistance to, to this idea. And I was always wondering why, and I think I have some possible answers. But the, the truth of the matter is that even though I've been, uh, I should say advocating, I'm advocating it as such, but advocating at least considering this possibility more seriously, but it was not so much a way because we don't see that uh, there's much activity. I mean, there's here and there are some attempts, but much less than, than on modified gravity, and I was asking myself why. So from the point of view of uh, people who write COEs, or, or device COEs, the developers, they are called here. So the, the issue is that indeed it seems, at least to me, because you know, I've, I've been trying to write such COEs for almost from the start, that it is more difficult. It is more difficult to, to implement some of the basic requirements that you want from, from a COE, such as have one that is conservation law, that have a linear invariance and so on, the necessary symmetry. So it's, it's simply more difficult. From the point of view of users, uh, again, there, there is resistance which is understandable, but not justifiable, I would say. So, because, uh, yeah, they tell the developers, uh, okay, give us a COE that we can use. And there isn't such a full-fledged COE that have been suggested. And uh, so, yeah, people are just happy to continue using the most modified gravity, which is understandable, as I say. But it, it, in any case, I don't think that these difficulties the fact that we as, as human beings find it difficult to write these theories uh, should argue against this approach. Okay? Because nature doesn't uh, go by our limitations. So na nature can solve very difficult problems, as you know, that we cannot. And, uh, so I, I think that absolutely no reason not to think about these theories in such, such direction, and they do have their attraction. In fact, yeah, I'll give you some examples that, uh, you know, I think general relativity is much harder than Newtonian relativity. Not only it has many potentials, but it is non-linear and very difficult to solve, and only, you know, very few problems in general relativity can actually be solved. If I ask you to, to do a, you know, a, a ten-body problem in general relativity, it's practically hopeless. Same is true of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is much more difficult. If I ask you to solve for some protein with uh, you know, a thousand, thousand atoms, it's very, very difficult. But it doesn't mean that, that the CO is not. So here are some, uh, I don't know what to call them admonitions, but uh, the appeal. So do not reject uh, modified inertia because uh, you, you don't feel comfortable with it. And also, which may also be partly why people uh, are somewhat reluctant to consider it, is that, uh, you know, that there has already been a lot of work done in modified gravity, and people might feel that this uh, trying to even consider modified inertia as an option sort of undermines what they did already, and, you know, that is not, in my, my opinion, it's not the case. So it's very important to continue and do, to work in detail with, with existing COEs, because I feel that they do capture much of the essence of MON, okay? So they, many of the things that will come out of these COEs will be valid and correct. And uh, yes, and, and uh, may, maybe applying these COEs will indeed encounter some problems, I mean, some, some tension with MON, and maybe this should be taken as hints for somewhat lo looking for somewhat uh, different COEs, but by no means it means that, that one should uh, sort of despair of these COEs or, or abandon them. So, yeah, the, the practical advice is just to continue to do, to, to do those things and, and do 
two simulations, try to test more as predicted by, by these existences. In a way of uh, alleviating fears or, or resistance, I, I, I'm pointing out here that actually special relativity can be considered 20 minutes or 30. <laughs> so I can talk about uh, something else. <laughs> okay, so uh, ju just to, it, it, it's, a, in, in a, it's a revelation that occurred to me at some point, the special relativity is, can be considered as modified the inertia, right? So gi given a force field, even in gravity, you can take a, a relativistic particle moving, say, in, in an elect a static electric field. So special relativity assumes that uh, F equals MA is not true anymore. It, it, uh, this is, a, of course, a famous formula. But you, you, can op you can sort of open it up and write it in terms of acceleration. And then it looks like this, the mass, which is now is the rest mass times that something gamma that depends on velocity. This depends on velocity times A. This is just a sort of a, a tensorial thing, so you have P times A which I, I wrote in an analogous way to, to the Mond formula. Okay, so it's, it's like introducing an interpolating function. In this case, of course, the, the modification hinges on velocity, not on acceleration. So the relevant uh, sort of, uh, interpolating function depends on velocity, not on, and of course, goes to one for velocity is much smaller than the speed of light becomes uh, you know, very, very large for velocities close to the speed of light because of this gamma. So, you know, it's, it's a mon-like equation. You can also invert it to look like a Q-mon, the equation. So, uh, with this, this new, so MA equals, instead of F equals mu times A, you have A equals mu times F. But there are also some, uh, okay, so, so if for, for circular orbits, for example, where V is perpendicular to A, this term disappears. So you get one behavior for when for, for linear for when acceleration is in the same direction as V, this term enters and you get a different dependence. So the, the, the acceleration, even given the force, the acceleration depends not only on your position in the field depends on your velocity, and it is different for different particles at the same position. Okay, so what, what are some lessons from, that we can maybe take from, from these two when constructing the modified inertia series from one? So in the first place, as I already mentioned, the interpolating function appears from, from the theory. It is not introduced by any. It is somehow induced by Lorentz invariance. One lesson. The other lesson is that you don't have just one interpolating function. There are several that appear even in this kinet kinet kinetic context. So one is the mu that I just described, and the gamma factor itself, the Lorentz factor itself, is a, an interpolating function. For example, appearing in uh, time dilations, uh, you know, the effect of uh, the lifetime of a particle moving with velocity v has gamma in it. So in general relativity, there are other interpolating functions. The potential, Schwarzschild potential, going from near the black hole to far outside, interpolating between the high relativistic regime and the And another important lesson, which also should be carried away to our case, is that there is no such thing as an acceleration field. Even if you have, let's say, you look at a electric field uh, between the plates of a capacitor, there is, a, there is an electric field, but you cannot, it does not define an, an acceleration field. So even if you consider electrons, only electrons, the same charge to mass ratio, as I mentioned before, the acceleration is not a function of position. It is also a function of the trajectory, the motion of the part. So suppose we have a, a, a modified inertia theory for a, for a galaxy. And suppose you measure accelerations of different test particles, of photons, of particles on circular orbits, of radially falling particles at the same position. OK? 
okay? You will not measure the same acceleration. So you cannot actually define an acceleration field for the galaxy. You cannot define, okay? It's not like modified gravity where there is a potential field and the potential defines an acceleration field. Of course, there, there is a field, but the, what, what is the same for all particles with all motions at the same position? It is the DPDT. So DPDT does equal the, <coughs> the force field, the forces at the disposition. Okay, but we are not measuring changes of momenta when we measure motions of test particles in gravitational fields. We do measure acceleration. So the distinction is between acceleration, which we measure it's again a kinematic quantity, the, the, the momentum and its relation to acceleration, to the, or DPDT and its relation to acceleration depends on the CO, depends on the motion. So it's important to remember. So there may not even be a well-defined notion of the acceleration field of the galaxy. So this may lead, for example, as I said, to, to disparity or, or disagreement between acceleration of particles measured at the same position in the galaxy because they, they move on different orbits. Yes, and very briefly, quantum mechanics is also can be considered as, uh, in some sense, a risky. Yes, uh, okay, so, well, maybe skip this. So quantum mechanics also, in, in, in a sense, um, it, it is modified inertia in, in this. Okay, so the potential that you plug into the Schrodinger equation is still the same potential that you use in classical physics. You don't change the you don't change the gravity in this case. What you do change is what the particle does, or how you describe what the particle does. And the change here is even much more drastic, and this is another lesson. So the degree of freedom of the particle is not anymore even just the R of t, it's not the position as a function of t that you want to calculate for. That the equation should tell you how to calculate. You know, it, it's a huge, huge uh, jump from classical physics. That it, now the particle is described by a wave function. It's a fuzzy thing. It's not a position. Uh, when you measure things, uh, you know, the collapse of the wave function. What is the meaning? That you, you can only, from the wave function, you can only deduce probabilities, not even uh, certain results, and so on. So it's a very uh, drastic departure from, from classical physics. And yesterday the question arose in the discussion, I think that you know, what, what is the possible ranges of, of CO that one can think of. So this quantum mechanics may inspire you to think in really crazy directions, even for more. I'm trying it, I'm not telling anyone, but uh, <laughs> you know, some of the things that I'm thinking of are quite crazy, so I uh, haven't had to anything yet. But it's something that we should keep in mind. And from this, similar lessons can be taken to be testing. So, yeah, another thing is, of course, which is also the case for, for relativity, is that, okay, the, the, there is a certain stage where you say, I freeze the forces and I only consider the change in the inertia of particles or only the description of, part, of part, how part the particle dynamics. But of course, this inevitably leads to also quanti uh, quantization of the fields themselves. Okay, so we have electric field, we static electric field, but uh, in quantum mechanics you also have to quanti quantize the field, of course. Uh, but that's the second stage. In the first stage we can consider the field as static and uh, only consider particle motions and the modification to their dynamics. And of course in quantum mechanics uh, there are similar lessons. For example, the, yeah, one is indeed, I already mentioned that it was emphasizing that the, the departure in MON can also be very drastic. We have so far limited ourselves to what rather mundane modifications, but can be drastic. Again, in quantum mechanics, uh, there are many interpolating functions. That's the, most uh, famous one and the one that started everything was the black body function, of course with Planck. So the Rayleigh genes, what we call the Newtonian or the 
classical regime was well understood, the film work of the Vaishnavim. Blanc could introduce his quanta to, to account for the other, uh, other regime. There's exponential line super, so you can see that black body has an interpolating function between Brady G and the beam law. Uh, when you quantize quantize in a box, for example, you, you get another interpolating function. Uh, when you the heat capacity of solids, you know that there is the classical limit at the long PT, uh, limit of constant uh, specific heat for solids, but in the quantum machine there is another dependence. Of course, what is common to all this is that there is H bar in the case of quantum mechanics, the analog of A0 is H bar. Uh, this is the new constant that was introduced. And again, all these expressions when H bar goes to zero, uh, formally takes you to the classical regime and you expect to re uh, restore the classical regime, classical results. And then in, in the, the other, other, other limit you get the quantum, the deep quantum regime. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and and quantum mechanics is also extremely difficult to solve. Of course, classical, classical mechanics is much simpler, much easier to solve. But it's a, the lesson is that we should not uh, abandon such approaches only because they look uh, more difficult. <coughs> yeah, so this is something I already said, that nature and physics are full, are replete with examples of acquired inertia, of uh, modified inertia, if you want. So this gives some hope that the uh, fundamental theory or, or at least the microscopic theory of uh, modified inertia could be found at some point. Right. So in the context of MOND, so um, what, what would, uh, you know, which way should we think about it? So even the first formulation is pristine and uh, what I call primitive better word uh, formulation of one looked like uh, something that uh, was modified inertia. And in fact, my, my own initial thought was about modified inertia. Of course, very, so, 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 so this kind of equation, very quickly, of course, I, I realized that you can invert it and write A as a function of God's phi, and that, that would look like modified gravity. But that is beside the point here. So what is wrong with this as modified inertia? Clearly, we know that it is not conservative, does not conserve momentum. If you try to apply it to both bodies, let's say in, in a two-body system, you'll see that, that they will just accelerate, the system will accelerate itself. So momentum is not conserved. So realizing this, I said, uh, okay, it is only applicable to motion of test particles. Again, putting uh, aside for, for, for a while the question of uh, how to solve this for, for general problem. And, in the end, Aqual, uh, Aqual uh, did that because it was based on Lagrangian. And as you know, action, action plus symmetries lead to conservation laws. So writing, a theory, writing some uh, theory in terms of in, in the Lagrangian and making sure that, co that the symmetries are there, rotational symmetry, translational symmetry, and so on, ensures momentum conservation, angular momentum, energy conservation, so time trans translation in that. Well, you, you can write a theory with a Lagrangian like this. So what is wrong with it? Why is it not what uh, we now use as a modified inertia? So it, the, the, this is uh, actually, if you write rotation, you, you can write a rotation here, you know, the equation for circular motion with this theory. It gives correct uh, expression for rotation curve. <coughs> so what is wrong with it? Uh, and it is a Lagrangian. But it is not uh, it is not Galilean value. So you know that, that this, when we speak of external field effect, we say that internal dynamics can depend on whether the system is accelerated or not. But this would be something in which the internal dynamics would depend on the velocity of the system. So that's that's right. That, you know, the galaxy that's moving uh, some some motion. Uh, will have a different internal dynamics that one that does not. And what is the frame, you know, about which uh, you, you want to 
to define your, your velocity and so on. So this is what is wrong with this kind of, 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 of series. So it's not as easy, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not as easy just to write down something very simple. In fact, at some point I, I proved, I think it's a proof, I, I'm not sure it will stand to scrutiny of mathematicians, but it is a, in a way proof that if you want Galilean variance, and you want, uh, of course, the standard uh, momentum, and also if you want it, the theory to be derived from an action that is Galilean variant, and has conservation loss, and has the mon and Newtonian limit, then it has to be non time non-local. This makes it a bit difficult to solve to, to, to solve some, to, to write such theories because non-locality is uh, well. Non-locality means that your the acceleration in a given moment depends not only on the force that you sense at that particular moment, but that someone knows about your the history beyond your. Again, it's not a, it's not a, an outrageous concept because. You know, even dynamical friction or friction in general is, is non-local. If, if something moves through a medium, then the, the friction that it senses at a given point of time does not depend only on what happens at this time, because the, the, the orbit has already disturbed the medium around the particle. Okay? And, uh, and so the, the effect at the given time depends on also on what happened before. Of course, we, we sort of shove this under the rug, assuming that the medium cures very quickly. But, but in principle, that is not so. So inertia is not, uh, I mean, uh, non-locality is not really outrageous if you come to think about it. And uh, yes, I get some intuition sometimes by thinking uh, modified inertia, by thinking about uh, say electronic devices. So you have a device, you have an input, and you have an output. So these are also they, they are time non local. Ten minutes from thirty just to ten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. So skipping all this and uh, anticipating that I will not actually be able to say all that I wanted, so I prepared a sort of preparatory slide uh, and, and uh, already mentioned some of the things that may be quite different in, in, uh, in modified gravity and uh, thus uh, modified inertia. So I, what I will do after, after this slide, I think, the next one, is to present a specific toy theory of modified inertia which is uh, easy to work with and to, to deduce uh, quite a few results from it. And so it, it is a, a very good, to me, a heuristic tool to, to, to demonstrate some of the things that I want to demonstrate. Um, like it, and, and it's something I thought about quite recently, maybe, maybe half a year ago. So this is uh, one of the motivations for my wanting to give this talk. So uh, what you will see, for example, in this, uh, in this particular, you can call it toy model. You don't have to take it too seriously. But anyway, it's good for demonstrating things. So uh, it, 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 in this theory, there is freedom. There is some freedom. Uh, and, and with some of this freedom, you can use and, and get situation in, in which the EFE is stronger than, uh, than, uh, than, than you have in aqua and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I hope to, to get to this point where I can uh, explain to you why it is. So for example, it makes the effect, of, it could make the effect of uh, the EFE on the outer, outer parts of rotation curve stronger than, than in aqua and common. It can, you know, strengths and uh, effect of uh, the, the production of warps by, by satellites such as the Milky Way warp by the Magellanic clouds. Uh, right, so in, in this theory, for example, the, the effect of the solar system on the Milky Way uh, is, is 
absent to me. Uh, just as in the case of the, of the standard EXT, the, the, the effect of the, of the radial acceleration field of the galaxy on the Z motions can be made stronger. And so it quenches even more effectively uh, things that happen on vertical dynamics, on the y binary dynamics. Dynamical friction I wasn't able to, to study in this theory, but I expect it could, could be different. I don't know. In the context of gravitational wave, it's not that I've done something on the subject, but it, it is interesting that for modified gravity in general, that since you are not modifying the let's say, the Einstein's part of, of the action. You do not modify the gravity. So, for example, uh, modified gravity theories tend to produce more, uh, more degree, gravitational degrees of freedom, so more, more modes, for example, in gravitational way. You have not only the, the, the tensor mode, you have scalar mode, vector mode in the case of ice, for example. But here, this will not be the case because you do not actually add gravitational degrees of freedom and I also think, even though I don't have a concrete proof that this is the case, that it will be much easier to get uh, the, the speed of gravitational waves to be the same as that of, of, uh, of electromagnetic waves. Because you know, modified gravity simply tells you how the motion of a lump of energy that is moving through your field or through your medium is affected. And I don't see reason that the lump that it should give different results for a lump of uh, you know, gravitational field and, uh, and of light. So it, it's just a thought that, that things might be easy. So, doing more that. So I will really have to skip much of it. I will only say that the way that non-locality is achieved here is to go to Fourier space. So in Fourier space, things actually look simple and local, and that is why the CO is so amenable. To, to, to calculations. So we have a many-body system. We consider one of the one of the bodies. It is subject to a force, uh, time-dependent force, which is simply the sum of the forces that uh, applied by all the other particles in the system. And we want to calculate its trajectory. So its trajectory is some r of t. Is the r of t here? Yeah, r of t here. I take the, the Fourier transform of R of T. Uh, this is the acceleration, uh, the, the Fourier, Fourier component of the acceleration. In Newtonian dynamics, it is simply 1 over n times the Fourier transform of the force. The force is time dependent, the trajectory is time dependent. F equals ma simply says that the Fourier transforms are related in the same way. But in this modified inertia, here I say, okay, I, I add this thing here, which would be like an, an interpolating function working in Fourier space. So it, 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 I call it the inertia functional. It is more complicated than just the, an interpolating function because it depends on the full trajectory. So it's a functional of the trajectory. Okay. And the mode limit, uh, just from scale invariance, requires that this functional goes like. Look, I, I don't expect you really to follow the, these technical details. I'm just telling you about them to see that I'm doing a, a serious job. Uh, really, what, what I'm interested in to, to bring on the results. So, very quickly, uh, the, the theory can be shown to, to satisfy all the standard conservation laws. So, there is a momentum. Of course, it is not just MV. The momentum just in special relativity. There's, uh, Momentum is defined differently. So if you wish, it is, it, it is defined in terms of its, its Fourier, Fourier, Fourier component. So when you go to, to, to real space, it, it's not local. It's not defined just by the velocity of the particle at this time, but also the history of the orbit. Uh, you can show there are four isolated systems, just uh, some of momenta is conserved. There is a of energy, conserved angular momentum, with definition of the center of mass. Interestingly, you can, at least in the deep mode regime, there is a reduced two-body problem, so any two-body problem can reduce to a one-body in the field problem. 
on interesting, we look at this, the effective mass is not in the Newtonian dynamics M1, M2 over M1 plus M2, as this form different to this mass. Okay, two body problem. Here is the first result that already differs from Cumond and, and, uh, and Aqual. And that is the, 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 the interval, the, the difference between the velocities of, of two bodies uh, in, a bound, in a bound system. So Ricardo Scarpa will show you the, the results for Cumond and, and, uh, and Aqual, which incidentally is also shared by this tripotential theory. So uh, that there is a relation uh, V to the force. These are the mass, the mass, uh, mass ratios, M1, M1 over big M and so on. So it's different from Cumon and Aqual. I mean, this, of course, it is still MGA squared, but the dependence on the mass ratios is somewhat different, already some interesting results. Harmonic oscillator can be solved exactly. General three, three-dimensional harmonic oscillators with uh, anisotropic with different uh, frequencies different, uh, can be solved exactly. And demonstrated, for example, that in this theory, the, the full trajectory is the, not in the theory, but only for harmonic oscillator. I'm not sure about general result. Because of the non-locality, it is not clear uh, whether it is still the case that two initial conditions determine the orbit completely, as it is in standard dynamics. But for harmonic oscillator, it is, so it is somewhat reassuring in a sense. And then to make things less, uh, less abstract, so this inertia functional that I didn't specify before when we told you what its limit should be in the in the Dirac regime, simplify by saying, okay, let's take it to be some function of uh, quantities that defined by the orbit and uh, their dimensions of acceleration. So the thing is that un unlike the, the modified gravity case where you can only define, at least in, in aqual and human, one acceleration parameter, which is gradient of phi, and that is why you end up with a, an interpolating function that is just one function of one variable. Here you can define more than one acceleration parameter for the orbit, and you can make this interpolating function into even a function of some of them. Okay, and uh, again, I'll, I'll jump this, and uh, at least you can. This is an example of two such acceleration parameters that you can define. Uh, they look they look uh, complicated, but actually they are not. They're simply if, if you have if you have a, let's say a single orbit with a single with a single frequency, okay, then one one of these one of these uh, one of these uh, acceleration parameters is not surprising. It's just omega uh, just omega square r which is the mean acceleration of the orbit. And the other definition is, uh, the other acceleration parameter is a, a parameter that vanishes for circular orbit, but does not vanish for, for elliptical orbits. I don't have time to explain it, but it is important to, to see, for example, in this case, the circular orbits, and let's say radial orbits, or non-circular orbits, will, depend, will have different interpolating functions. Okay, that is one important thing. So now I'm simplifying even further. I'm saying, let's say, I'm just even just taking interpolating function to depend only on on the single parameter. Even then, you you have departures from standard understanding. So five minutes or not yet? What two minutes? Say five. Very fast. <laughs> okay. 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 So I just very briefly go ahead and rush through the results. Um, for example, rotation curves. What happens in rotation curves? If, the, if for exact circular orbits, plane, exact circular and planar orbits, there is a, a unique prediction of all, in fact, all modified inertia theories, which is the standard algebraic relation. This has been known for a long time. Okay, so, but, you have to be careful in, in this case because particles in, in these galaxies do not move on exact radial and planar orbit. There are also Z motions and there are also radial 
motions, and in, in this case, the, those motions affect the predicted rotation curve. Not very much, because the accelerations on them are uh, smaller normally, but it has to be realized that in, in this case, the, the, uh, the, for, uh, for, for, for the ideal case, the, this A2 parameter, for example, that is described is zero, so it does not even enter the rotation curve itself. But it does enter other effects. So if you try to deduce the uh, interpolating function from rotation curve, you get incomplete information about the interpolating function. And you certainly you don't know how it depends on this other parameter. Um, OK, effects of radial motion. So, so here I try to capture what the effect of, of z motions on the rotation curve are. You, you can see that. Uh, the acceleration that enters the, the mu, the, the, the interpolating function, is not just the circular acceleration here, but there is contribution from the z motions. And it uh, basically, because it makes mu a little larger, it reduces the predicted rotation velocity. And this happens essentially mostly in the inner, inner part, where so the z motions are more important. Uh, I should also mention that because different populations in the galaxy, uh, different populations in the galaxy can have different, uh, do have different z motions, different z acceleration, they could have some somewhat different rotation, rotation curves as well. No, skip this. There's of course, some effect on the vertical motion. Uh, okay, it's just what I mentioned in the beginning when I anticipated that. I will not really be able to explain all this. So the, 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 the external field effect of the radial acceleration on the z motions in, in this theory can be la larger by uh, even by, by a factor of a few. So for example, near the solar near the solar circle, where the, the, the radial acceleration is about two a naught. The actual acceleration that enters the external field effect could be several times that, so maybe five or six, I know. Okay, so it, it rather quenches both C motions and, uh, and other phenomena such as binary, uh, binary dynamics in, in this way. Um, yes, well, I think this gives a gist of the possibilities that we see or something really important that I want to say. Yeah, it, yeah the theory has a, a good center of mass motion. So there's always a question of how come, you know, a star in a galaxy moves with the correct moment acceleration when its constituents inside move with very high accelerations. So the total acceleration is really large. How come the center of mass knows to move with the correct moment so in, in aqual and cumon and so on, this is a solved problem. Uh, and here it is also. Uh, yeah, uh, just state the fact that uh, actually the, 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 there's no, basically no effect uh, of, of, the, of the external field of the, of the galaxy on the inner solar system. It is a peculiarity of the Poisson or Poisson-like nature of aqual and cumon that, that appears as uh, sort of a lump of, of phantom, phantom matter at the point where the, the field of the sun uh, cancels with the field of the galaxy. There is a lump of positive and negative phantom matter that, that creates some uh, poss possibly detectable effect in the solar system. This effect disappears in this uh, general effects on the external field effect. And yeah, there are many, of course, far from being complete, far from being uh, full theory, it's far from being uh, satisfactory in all reasons, and there are many open questions that, uh, that loom, uh, at least in the connection of this particular toy model, but maybe in connection with uh, modified inertia in general. Thank you.
you very much. Uh, it's really, really amazing talk. And I have a question because at the, at the beginning you were saying that modified gravity, even if it it's got some different prediction with modified inertia, it can still capture the nature of mode in general. And, and for me, one of the, of the fundamental nature of mode is predicted, which is not predicted in Newton, is the external field effect. And it seems that at the end of, of this presentation, we're saying that in some cases, it's, it's, kind of possible that it, it's possible that the modified inertia doesn't capture this, doesn't make an external field effect. No, remember, uh, OK, maybe you want to continue, but you, you mean about the galactic field effect in the, in the, in the solar system? Well, it is not exactly the external field effect, because remember, the, the, we're talking about the external field being, being much, much weaker than the, than the internal field. It's a completely different situation from, from the standard. External field effect is when the external field is important. It changes, it actually changes the acceleration, the total acceleration. Here it doesn't change. Actually, there, there is an effect. Okay, but it's, uh, look, you see, th th this is the, the new function that you have to take into account in the solar system. Is, this is G internal, and this is G of the external field. It is there, but it, look, it is negligible. And all, all that it does is to change mu at the value of, the, of, the, of its parameter, of its variable that is huge. Okay, so there, there is an external field in this sense, but the, the effect that we have in human and, and aqua are not of the same type. They are not really the, in the sense that you, you change the acceleration. So it's not, it doesn't tell us that we move it. So, so there is external field, but it is, it is, it is very, very minor, very minor. And so my, my question was, uh, what are the other fundamental behavior of mod? What is the other? Uh, fundamental, um, yeah, meanings of uh, different characteristic in modes that you have, except that. Well, there is an external field effect, there is an important effect, as I said. <coughs> For example, what, what the, the radial been? motion on the Z motion could even be stronger than in aqua and, and human. It can be stronger. Or on binary, so. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this introduction of uh, modified inertia, which seems to make it much more uh, sort of a likable, <laughs> workable uh, than, uh, than it was. Uh, I guess I'm very stereotyped by uh, the sum of things you listed very early, finding it very hard. Uh, you used Lawrence as an uh, analogy, a Lawrence transformation as an analogy of changing inertia. Um, I believe there is also a symmetry there, lens symmetry, that, uh, that is different from Mont one, and maybe uh, you could talk about that. And another thing I want to uh, just get a, a quick opinion. Um, can we also generalize to think Einstein's uh, field equation as, um, as some kind of a modified inertia of other possible field equations in the sense that the lambda term, for example, you can move it to the left or to the right hand side of the equation. And uh, lambda may even be in general, like in many flavors, trying to explain it uh, using modified gravity, lambda was actually given as a field uh, or given as a organic part of gravity. So by moving it to the left, you are making it like a mod one would be having a modified gravity, but moving it to the right side of the Einstein equation, the lambda is a map, is a kind of a matter, a modified kind of a matter that you have to, uh, but it doesn't have to be a constant in a most general context. I was wondering it has sense of increasing the inertia of the t mu nu of ordinary matter. It, can you phrase the lambda as a modified inertia of ordinary no, no matter? That, not that I can see in the sense that uh, you know t mu nu comes from the from the matter from the free free matters well okay so t 
d mu nu in Einstein's equation has two sources, if you wish. The one, the, it, it comes from the meta parts of the, of the action. And the meta parts have the free parts, the free actions, and the interactions. Okay? So let, let's say uh, inertia would be embodied in the, what, at least the way I see it, in the free parts of the action. So adding lambda there is just adding another source of matter. You are not really modifying the inertia. For example, the equations of motion of particles okay, will not be affected by this lambda in the sense, not the inertia part. Okay, so I, May I just, uh, just to make an uh, example where that could happen? For example, you think of the models by uh, Mendoza, they're f of t and, uh, you know, f of t and, uh, uh, you know, r, uh, not r, uh, r would be modified in the graph. Of, uh, r of t or something. Oh, there are com organic combination of the lambda term with, uh, uh, with the matter term. Uh, in that way, uh, one can enforce it as a, a, a modifying the t nu of ordinary matter. Okay, so what, there is some let us energy let, surrounding ordinary let us matter. Say, I mean, what is t mu nu? t mu nu, basically, you get from varying the matter actions with respect to the, to the matrix. So if you don't touch the matter actions, you don't change t mu nu. The fact that t mu nu enters into the equation of gravity doesn't modify t mu nu itself. It doesn't modify the matter actions. But, uh, but it's a matter of semantics. I don't. Yeah, that's I, what, uh, I was just wondering if you like to think. That. It's, so, no, it's not the way I think about it. Okay, that's, that's all I want. Okay. Makes uh, this movement uh, more clear, but uh, you mentioned non-gravitational force, and I was wondering if you change inertia, then you will spoil all what the uh, agreement is in electrical force, electromagnetic particle, that don't need modified uh, things, and uh, in this case, do, don't you modify the electromagnetism? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question that uh, was asked, and it's in the papers, and uh, but, but uh, so, so Clearly, uh, well, first of all, it, it will have to be modified at low acceleration, so it's not clear uh, what to do about them. You know, all the observational evidence that we have is from gravity. So we're not really sure that uh, you know, this is required, but the question is whether it can be implemented without changing anything. Because uh, uh, I imagine that you have an atoms in uh Mond regime, and then you have the same kind of uh, lines and transitions, and you don't uh, modify it. <laughs> no, but the question is wh what characteristics of the electromagnetic field will have to be compared with a knot to tell us it's not so much that modifying uh, the electromagnetism where, when it is in some gravitational field or not. It is the question of what characteristic of the electromagnetic field we have to compare, let's say, with A naught to tell us whether we have to modify or not. So you, yes, you know because what we, we measure from quasar absorption lines in very diffuse media. Where the accelerations within atoms are huge, for example. For example, yes. A naught, I have some examples that have been given popular articles, is the acceleration that a proton applies to an electron that is, I think, a thousand kilometers away from it. So in the atom, the accelerations are huge, and so it could Maybe be you have cosmic rays, and you can measure their dynamics, and you will modify this dynamics where you don't need to. So there is still a long way to go with this. For example, you want to explain lensing. I didn't say anything about lensing. I think it was one of the things in the last... So suddenly you want to change also the way photons behave, right? the different inertia. So that, that would, of course, uh, imply changing the... Electromagnetism, but uh, if in the end it turns out that this has something to do with some medium, for example, which is a, an attractive idea, then it might be easy because uh, you know, the medium would affect photon, would affect everything. Uh, 
about the effects of vertical motions on the rotation curves in your toy theory. If I understand correctly, if I look at a dynamically cold population, let's say cold gas, and a dynamically hot population like cold stars in the same galaxies, of course they have a different rotation curve because of the pressure effects, the rotation curve that we measure. But if we could you know, precisely account for the pressure effects, there should be, still be a difference because of the modified inertia bond effect. But you could also, right? you, yes, but you could also look at say different stellar populations where there's no pressure of you mean like pressure, dynamic pressure? Or yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, let's say I look at a population with a low V over sigma and then a population with a high V over sigma, uh, and suppose I can correct for yes. sigma to get the circular velocity of the yes. equivalent so in principle uh, you, should, you, mass. you should get slightly different rotation at speed. And do you know what is the per percentage effect on that? Can you tell what is more, I mean, the degree of the difference? Well, it depends, it depends very much on where you are in the, gal in the galaxy because, uh, well, I, I didn't have time to mention this, but, but the, the, the strength of the effect depends on the relative frequencies of circular motions to the z-motion. You know, it depends on where you are in the galaxy. I think uh, far outside it, it, it's a very small effect, but maybe in, in the more inner part of the frequencies. Uh, yeah, that's good, because in the inner part you can measure what star you got. So it's a possible test. So, so in principle. But I, do, I want to warn you not to, not to take this theory too seriously also, yes? <laughs>